Lance Wilson, better known by his street alias Ryder, was a short-tempered and deceptively cunning de facto sergeant-at-arms of the Grove Street families in 1992. His role also extended to being a tactician as he often planned out expeditions which he carried through alongside CJ. Ryder is often depicted as being brazen and impulsive, occasionally taking action without realizing the repercussions that may follow. Oh, oh no! But by and large, it is undeniable that he predominantly acts to preserve the credibility of the gang and his peers. Much of his sometimes volatile demeanor can be attributed to him acting out due to his substance addiction, as he is rarely seen not indulging said vice. In the first quarter of the story, Ryder is delineated as being close with CJ, arguably even closer than CJ's own brother. When he isn't assisting CJ personally to complete a mission, he is rarely seen doing anything not securing the gang. His alliance with Smoke and the Ballers almost seems non-existent as we see him taking out Ballers with reckless abandon on more than one occasion. During the events of the Mulholland intersection shootout, it is revealed that Ryder and Smoke formed a coup to usurp Grove Street family leader Sweet. Being supported by an alliance comprising of the Ballers and Tenpenny. Moreover, it is revealed that the duo were complicit in the maladroit hit which resulted in the passing of Beverly Johnson. The ensuing events lead to Grove Street family's hold on territories starting to unravel with the absence of the founding members. CJ is later obligated to confront Ryder after intercepting him at a meet Ryder attended with Loco Syndicate's head of security, T-Bone Mendez, in San Fierro. However, the story continuity leading to the events at Pier 69 can be dubitable when one takes into account all that has been established with the character in prior events. Is there more to the story? What would San Andreas look like had Ryder not been a part of Grove Street families? Let us take a deeper look into this. Ryder demonstrated his proclivity for illicit dealings at a young age, as confirmed by CJ in an earlier encounter. Because you've been dealing drugs, miss, since the age of 10. No, that ain't it. He is a close ally and high-ranking member of the Grove Street family's gang. Therefore, it is more than likely he has been a member for at least a decade. He is often heavily leaned on for major operations, which speaks to how much strength he adds to Grove Street families, as well as his dutiful nature. Early on, after making his return to San Andreas, CJ tries to regain his position of authority when rejoining Grove Street, and is blackballed by his brother and the majority of foot soldiers. Come on, dude, what up? With no, man. The only person willing to work side by side with CJ is in fact Ryder, despite making the occasional disparaging remark. What you saying about me, fool? Sure, man. I'm saying that the East Coast made you dry like an idiot, fool. Man, you always crash. Even though he himself deals with substance afflictions, he surprisingly is not in favor of gang members being addicts. Damn dope fiends and drug addicts everywhere in the city. Piss me off. And he abets CJ to help eradicate the drug issue plaguing the neighborhood. In turn, taking the first steps in getting the gang back on its feet and back into fighting shape to take on their encircling enemies. Had CJ not had this type of support from Ryder, it stands to reason 
that many of the early steps taken by CJ and the gang would feasibly never come to pass were it not for him. Ryder next proves his invaluableness by independently setting up opportunities to obtain large quantities of weaponry in the mission's home invasion and robbing Uncle Sam. Showcasing his cunning and resourcefulness by allying himself with a contact involved in the black market known as LB. Once again, instead of simply just delegating duties to foot soldiers, Ryder himself actively takes part in carrying out these dealings, proving that he is as witty as he is pragmatic. Realizing his core involvement and him basically being single-handedly responsible for getting Grove Street families armed on a mass scale. It's certain that Grove Street would most likely have acquiesced to their adversaries earlier on in the story, even despite CJ's return. Having no clear way to compete with their rivals either financially or physically, thus most likely being killed off fairly easily due to their severely lacking presence, strength and firepower while their rivals grew ever stronger. Conversely, as we alluded to before, Ryder along with Big Smoke ultimately assumed the mantle of Grove Street families for some time and regrettably proceed to join the Loco Syndicate. This event plays a pivotal part of the story and actually turns out to be a move which has been years in the making. The main reasoning behind this is thought to be driven by pecuniary desires. The deal also plausibly can be seen as an undertaking Ryder and Smoke secretly agree on as an attempt at circumventing Tenpenny and Pulaski's crash division or, if we are giving them too much credit, merely a byproduct extension to said operation. In the end, this renders Wilson little more than a pawn, though it would seem that there is most likely a larger plan at play. Did Ryder simply reciprocate Smoke's vision due to the promise of wealth? Or was his arm twisted in much the same manner as CJ's? Was Ryder's compliance with Smoke's wishes a cut and dry case of greed? Or did Tenpenny hold leverage over him as he did with CJ and Smoke? Things get even more interesting when we do a little digging and analyze key plot points leading up to Ryder's final moments. As well as look behind the curtain and discover a few segments that were left out of the game in the beta plans. Like many high ranking members in Grove Street families, Ryder displays proficiency with a myriad of weapons, which include SMGs, assault rifles, pistols, as well as melee and explosive weapons. Ryder also claims to have kung fu and ninja skills. However, it seems unlikely that he has had any official training. So, it's assumed that he honed his combat skills through his years of service to the gang in the streets. Juxtaposing this, he seems to have keen knowledge or at least an enthusiastic affinity of military insight, as he was able to orchestrate a break-in to a National Guard military compound. Despite Ryder downplaying this, National Guard bases are inhabited by trained personnel with access to military-grade equipment. So this is no small feat and actually ranks as Ryder's greatest achievement. Granted he was underpinned by CJ, we still have to take into account that he spends most of his time intoxicated, making this feat look even more impressive. It also begs the question of what a sober rider would be capable of. 
He also coordinates a house invasion of a particular military veteran known as Colonel Furberger. This feat is not as spectacular as the former, yet this does solidify Ryder as being one of the only characters in the entire game who is daring enough to engage with the San Andreas military. He manages to do this while not incurring a wanted level on both occasions, which seems to suggest that he may have bribed some influential law officials. Which leads us to our next point. Ryder seems to possess innate skill in brokering deals and negotiation, as both times when CJ intervenes in loco syndicate business. It is not Smoke, but Ryder who seems to have been chosen to handle representation for Grove Street families. Looking at Ryder's afflictions, it's clear that he most likely would not have required much coercion into joining the substance trade. Given the fact that he never really made any attempt to hide his affinity for said substances, and is known to have dabbled in their dealings at a young age. But from what we now know of his character, it's alarmingly obvious that Ryder is many things, but a traitor is not among them. This theory is corroborated in his actions. If the main goal of the alliance he had with Big Smoke was to take out the Johnson brothers, then, to put it bluntly, Big Smoke couldn't have chosen a worse ally, as Ryder was the closest to CJ and subsequently had many, many opportunities to take CJ out. Yet, we never see him act aggressively towards Carl, unlike Smoke, whom we know to have taken CJ on a number of excursions in which he covertly tried to have him assassinated by outsiders. Even while being apprehended at the pier in San Fierro, Ryder does not once think to try and open fire on CJ. The single greatest threat to his entire operation, even during the boat chase. In the beta plans for the game, it seems Ryder was meant to be gunned down during the Pier 69 meet, and CJ was originally planned to engage T-Bone Mendez in the boat chase. There are recorded dialogue audio files for Ryder's last words and T-Bone Mendez telling Carl that he will confront him later. These are contained within the game files, which supports this theory. What makes this even more apparent is that Ryder is the only main character who uses recycled dialogue as his last words. This proves that, at the very least, there was a bit of dissension regarding the end of Ryder's character arc during development. As he is such a well-developed character, there are a couple of plausible scenarios we can envision to see how things would have likely turned out for him. Given the way Ryder carries himself, it's much more likely that he would have, over time, either died in battle alongside Grove Street members or defected from the main Grove Street family faction, much like Big Bear did after the passing of Brian Johnson. In fact, Big Bear and Brian's close friendship mirrors many aspects of Ryder and CJ's relationship where Big Bear, being closer to Brian than his actual brothers, was heartbroken by his passing and subsequently fell into substance abuse following his death. Ryder's arc could have been concluded in much the same way, however highlighting how his reckless nature proves to be his undoing and him possibly being slain by the baller's Captain Kane, Tenpenny or even Pulaski. In this way, we strengthen either of the main antagonists, shine the light on Grove Street family's unlikely underdog story, give weight to their resolve regarding brotherhood, and give Ryder an ending befitting his beginning. Alternatively, given his substance use, it's also likely he would be exiled by the Johnson brothers, 
and would leave to join another rogue chapter, such as the Temple Drive or Seville Boulevard families. Or, when we take into account his high rank and deceptive cunningness and negotiation skills, he would most likely have began his own family set, still retaining some of his roots to Grove Street families. This could satisfy Rockstar's desire of ultimately portraying him to be a villain, while still retaining some of his loyalties to the gang. This could have been played up as a Civil War subplot, where CJ and Sweet demonstrate their resolve to try and uphold the gang's core beliefs against substance abuse. An interesting dialogue between Ryder and CJ could have taken place before CJ is forced to take him down. And Ryder, in his last moments, could have gone out confessing that his main reason for using the substances was due to him missing Carl during his time in Liberty City and thinking his close friend would never return. But being so far gone that he just did not have the wherewithal to kick the habit once CJ returned. Entrusting Grove Street pride with CJ and Sweet to now finish things with Smoke and Tenpenny. Again, this scenario strengthens the main antagonists and, oddly enough, foreshadows the constant infighting regarding core ideals in Grove Street families that proves to be a recurring theme in the future, even up until Grand Theft Auto V. In any event, it's clear that if anyone was really a brother to CJ, it was Ryder. CJ expresses the most disdain and resentment over his yeah. passing. What are you gonna do, huh? Ryder, man! That was my homie! And I killed him! Ryder was more helpful than he was ever needy, and he never shied away from a chance to fight alongside his Grove Street family brothers, especially CJ. Oh, the wall, huh? Hey CJ, strap up! It's Grove Street! And in the beginning of the story, when no one else believed in him or was willing to stand by and help him, not even Sweet. They make a break for it. Okay, I'm gonna come pick you up. Hell no! This is your gig, CJ. You need some stripes. Get over to Army Nation and get a heater. Ryder was the only one willing to accompany CJ in the early half of the story. On ventures ultimately aiding the rest of the gang. Mommy, your stuff was tight. Yeah, you too, homie. Up until him being not so subtly shoehorned in with the rest of the traitors and colluders, there is no real reason for him to betray the gang. What makes it even less believable is the fact that he is almost never mentioned by most of the characters in a treacherous manner other than when he is slain. Hey, relax, man. It's gonna get handled when it's time. We already know who the f***ing bad guys are, man. Your stinking grocery for the smoke and those chota pigs, Ted Benny and, and Pulaski. Smoke, he's a pusher, man. No, no, not smoke. He might mess with Crash, but he don't mess with no yay. Come on, CJ, how you think he got that new house, huh? Just let that grow for life b go and take a look around you. Nice, clean air. Smoke. Oh, sweet! Now you stay the f away from smoke and stay the f away from us. Otherwise, take a good hard look over there. Just watch, homie. What the f? Oh, no. Shit, smoke, what you into? Shit, smoke? Wow. Crash making you sell us out? Moms! Nevertheless, when it was all said and done, Ryder was an incredible deutragonist. One of the most memorable in the entire GTA franchise. For the most part, he acted selflessly. Neither he nor the writers seemed to actually realize his potential. And even in his final moments of supposed betrayal, he acted loyally. 
a magnificent character, one I wish we get to see expanded on in a possible San Andreas Stories segment, which Rockstar might hopefully produce in the future, possibly detailing the origins of Grove Street families and their rise to prominence.